Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to this webinar organized by Lord Alton of Liverpool in the cooperation with the Coalition for Genocide Response and the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. My name is Evelina Ohab, and I'm the co-founder of the Coalition for Genocide Response. I'm joined by my colleague Jess Templeman and a wonderful panel of experts that I will introduce shortly. Today, today our focus is on the issue of the trafficking of North Korean women to China. Reportedly, tens of thousands of North Korean women and girls are being trafficked into China and sold into the sex trade. The business of the sale of North Korean women is worth an estimated 105 million US dollars annually. It is a business that will not cease on its own. The trafficking of North Korean women to China is followed by several crimes. Recent reports suggest that once trafficked, North Korean women in China are subjected to systematic rape, sexual slavery, sexual abuse, prostitution, cyber sex, forced marriage, and forced pregnancy. When caught, these women would be returned to North Korea, where they would face appalling treatment. When North Korean women are pregnant with Chinese men, they will be subjected to forced abortions in North Korea. Infanticide is also not uncommon. In 2014, a renowned law firm, Hogan Lowells, published a legal opinion suggesting that the practice of forced abortions and infanticide of half Chinese children may amount to genocide. Seven years later, this practice continues. Today, the panelists will discuss the issue of trafficking and associated crimes and consider what can be done to address the issue. Speakers include Lord Alton of Liverpool, crossbench peer at the UK House of Lords, and co-chair of the all-party parliamentary group on North Korea and patron of the Coalition for Genocide Response. Greg Scarlatio, executive director of the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea, and Jihan Park, North Korean defector and human rights activist. And now without any further ado, I would like to give the floor to Lord Alton of Liverpool. Thank you very much, uh, Evelina. Dr. Ohab has done a wonderful job in bringing panels like this together in this webinar this evening. And she is right that I'm very pleased to be, proud to be a patron of the Coalition for Genocide Response, uh, and that I also co-chair the all-party parliamentary group on North Korea with my illustrious colleague, Fiona Bruce, member of parliament. Uh, but I'm also a trustee of a charity called the Arise Foundation, which works with people who have been trafficked or have been victims of um, not just trafficking, but modern day slavery as well. So bringing together all of those interests, I was particularly pleased that this theme has been chosen for this evening. The All Party Parliamentary Group on North Korea is currently carrying out an investigation into what we've done or what we've failed to do following the landmark report of the United Nations Commission of Inquiry in 2014. So seven years have passed and that report, which has some extraordinary recommendations, it says that crimes against humanity are literally being committed in North Korea. It recommends a referral to the International Criminal Court, but because of vetoes uh, from countries like China at the Security Council, it has prevented any action from being taken. So the All Party Group is looking at that question, and as part of it, the inquiry, it's become uh, it, very interested in going back to some of the issues that it's explored in the past. And one of those has been the trafficking, particularly of women, across the border between the DPRK and China, and what awaits them on the other side. That incidentally has been given even greater focus recently during COVID-19 by stories coming out of Chinese towns like Dandong, where North Korean women have been sent by the regime to work for rack rates in sweat labor, and most of the remittances being then taken by the state. Um, so again, these women being used as slave labor. In this case, so being trafficked not by gangs, but by a state itself and being used by that state in order to, <laughs> to use its funds. And we've seen what it's done with those funds in the past, not to feed the people, not to provide social uh, welfare and health and support, but to provide weapons of mass destruction. So we'll be hearing more about that, I'm sure, during the seminar as we proceed. But I want to say a word about the witness sessions which I've chaired at Westminster on behalf of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on North Korea, during which I've been particularly struck by the dignity and the courage of North Korean women who've given us 
evidence in the face of terrible suffering and appalling experiences and often a deep sense of separation and loss many of those women have retained their poise and their their certainty that the future will sweep away the tyranny which has led to so much hardship and so much depredation so many so much suffering although north korea's regime tries to conceal information and hold its entire people hostage and data has to be collected therefore often through quite unorthodox routes nevertheless escapees now from a significant diaspora uh, have increasingly found their voice in prizing open this uh, what is often called hermit kingdom this secret state i've personally been to north korea on four occasions and know not just how oppressive it is but how difficult it is to actually see any reality because they so often manipulate visits that all that has happened really is is that you are put through the motions and a great deal of concealment takes place but i've also traveled through china to jilin province uh, on the border with north korea and have seen the places where escapees have risked their lives and some have lost those lives in order to seek work by crossing rivers like the yalu and the tumen over the decades many women have made these perilous journeys in the hope of earning money which could be sent to feed and sustain their families as always brokers spot an opportunity to capitalize on human misery and with promises of riches and a better life they've turned their attention to human trafficking the us state department's 2020 trafficking in persons report stated this traffickers operate networks spanning from china into north korea to recruit north korean women and girls to smuggle them into china these women are subjected to physical abuse and sexual exploitation by their traffickers forced into commercial sex in brothels or through internet sex sites or compelled to work as hostesses in nightclubs or karaoke bars traffickers sell north korean women the report says to chinese men for forced marriages that's often i say in parenthesis as a result of the ccp the chinese communist party's own one child policy which has so distorted the demography of china so that you now have uh, roughly 30 million more men than women so these forced marriages are then arranged using north korean girls and women and whereby the report says they're subsequently forced into commercial sex domestic service agriculture or other types of work these victims the report says often lack identification documents and bear children with chinese men which further hinders their ability to escape as many as 30,000 children born in china to north korean women and chinese men have not been registered upon birth rendering them stateless and vulnerable to possible exploitation it found if found by chinese authorities victims are often forcibly returned to the dprk where they are subject to harsh punishment including forced labor in labor camps torture forced abortion or death so that's the end of the quote from that report now apart from the offense of human trafficking from north korea to china other violations of human rights occur egregious violations including enslavement forced labor rape sexual viol violence but also forcible return of individuals who should qualify for protection as refugees it's entirely contrary to the convention on the treatment of refugees to refool anyone who's at serious risk of torture inhuman and degrading treatment or punishment the chinese communist party returns men women and children to north korea knowing that the fate awaits them that i've just described in doing so it's acting contrary to international law and furthermore as some reports suggest north korean women who are pregnant with chinese men on their return to north korea are as the u.s report said forcibly aborted ending the life of the child in its mother's womb the united nations office of the high commissioner for human rights in 2020 issued a report i still feel the pain 
It revealed that, and again, I quote from the UN report now, a woman detained in a Ministry of People's Security, Jip Kai also, in 2015, reported the following. I suffered no violence, but the other woman had become pregnant in China, so the guards knew that her baby had Chinese blood. This was an issue as the local laws prevented any North Korean woman from giving birth to a mixed race baby. The doctor in the MPS center told her to get an abortion, despite the fact she wanted to keep the baby. She was eventually forced to have an abortion and sent to a Kwai Ho Ho So. Jubilee campaign reported that pregnant North Korean women who are forcibly repatriated face horrific abuse. Despite that, the government of North Korea claims to protect and preserve the rights of pregnant women, though it says it does this in its law on protection of the rights of women. Security isn't provided uh, to women who are repatriated. Testimonies from a myriad of North Korean defector women reveal that this was a common form of punishment. Listen to this quote. I suffered no violence, but the other woman had become pregnant, so the guards knew that her body had mixed race blood. This was an issue in the local laws. It prevented all North Korean women from giving birth to a mixed race baby. And the doctor said she had to have an abortion. Uh, similar findings were identified in the 2014 report of the Commission of Inquiry that I referred to at the beginning of, of, of our webinar. That was in 2014. It stated that repatriated women who are pregnant are regularly forced to undergo an abortion a practice that is driven by racist attitudes towards persons from China and to inflict punishment on women who have committed a serious offence by leaving the country. Although the Commission of Inquiry found that crimes against humanity have been committed, there has been no improvement of the situation and no blueprint to address the atrocities. It was an issue I raised earlier today with our Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab. Be clear, Children of North Korean women and Chinese men, apart from not qualifying for protection in China, also do not qualify for protection in North Korea. Indeed, as those reports from the US State Department, from Jubilee Campaign, from the United Nations all say, because the children are born to women who have fled as refugees and are often the children of Chinese men, they are additionally not recognized by the North Korean government and worse. So they are dealt, if you like, a double blow. Over recent years, we've seen more and more evidence of atrocities perpetrated against North Korean women, including their trafficking to China, forced repatriation, and subsequent abuse. So like fireflies, we need to shine a light on this situation, which is why I commend the Coalition for Genocide Response for organizing this webinar today. And I hand the, the session back now to Dr. Ohab, who will introduce the next speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lord Olton. And I would like to give the floor to Greg Scarlatoyo. Greg, the floor is yours. Dr. Ohab, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, thank you first and foremost for holding this event and highlighting the situation of traffic North Korean women. Let me thank my distinguished co-panelists, the Right Honorable Lord David Olton of Liverpool, uh, this is Chion Park and also Dr. Uh, Evelina O'Hub for organizing and also my uh, colleague Amanda Morkwood O, HRNK, human rights attorney for working with Dr. O'Hub on this event and of course our moderator today, Jess Templeman. Please allow me to begin with a uh, shameless act of self-promotion. Uh, HRNK has been the leading US-based bipartisan non-governmental organization in the field of DPRK human rights research and advocacy. For the past 20 years, our mission is to focus international attention on human rights abuses in the DPRK and advocate for an improvement in the lives of 25 million North Koreans. Since our establishment in 2001, we have played, we want to say, a leadership role in DPRK human rights issues by publishing 49 major reports, which have addressed issues including political purges, prison camps, the Songbun social and political classification system and trafficked North Korean women and children. Um, our reports are available at hrnk.org as PDF files. 
we have held UN ECOSOC consultative status since April 2018. Uh, please allow me to present to your attention two main issues and several recommendations that I would like to submit to the attention of my distinguished co-panelists and audience. First, I would like to highlight our organization's accountability and documentation efforts regarding trafficked North Korean women and children, particularly in North Korean detention. Since 2018, HRNK has conducted a project in collaboration with the International Bar Association entitled Documenting Human Rights Abuses in North Korea. We have interviewed over 50 former North Korean prisoners who have escaped to South Korea and who were previously imprisoned in short-term detention facilities in North Korea. The detention period of these former prisoners spans from 1996 to 2019 in approximately 37 detention facilities. This project points specifically to significant abuses and 10 of the 11 crimes against humanity inside North Korea's short-term detention facilities. This does not include the political penal labor colonies, the quality so camps. There is substantial evidence that a wide range of crimes against humanity has been committed in short-term detention facilities in North Korea in direct violation of Article 7 of the Rome Statute. These crimes arguably include murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, imprisonment in violation of international law, torture, rape, and other sexual violence of comparable gravity, persecution on grounds of religion and gender, enforced disappearances, and other inhumane acts. All of the affiants provided evidence of torture. When not undergoing interrogation by the Ministry of State Security in interrogation or detention facilities, which often include beatings and sometimes uh, sexual violence, former prisoners describe conditions and treatment as being crammed into small, dirty cells with other prisoners, including pregnant women and children, being forced to sit in one position all day long, unable to move, talk, or even use the toilet unless granted rare permission. Women who had stayed in China were seen as traitors to the country and at times treated more harshly. Prisoners repeated the sentiment from prison officials that women with, as they put it, half Chinese babies or Chinese seed were traitors to their home country. Prisoners recalled forced abortions and times when women were forced to work in the fields despite being pregnant and needing medical care. China's security officials actively coordinate with North Korea's Ministry of State Security to return escapees across the border. These escapees are often women and children. We found evidence confirming that North Korean prison officials committed crimes against humanity against female prisoners. These crimes included rape and sexual violence of comparable gravity during the interrogation and detention process in the DPRK, torture in DPRK interrogation and detention facilities, and enslavement. Our findings show there is a disproportionate repression of North Korean women and girls by DPRK officials amounting to crimes against humanity. There is surely also an argument for genocide, which I will discuss in just a few minutes. Uh, HRNK will continue to document these cases. For the sake of this discussion, I'd like to focus on the accounts of forced abortion and infanticide and poor treatment against North Korean women who were in China and then were detained in North Korea. There is certainly a culture of impunity and, and gender and social class discrimination that permeates North Korean society. North Korean women and children have no legal protection once they arrive in China, whether willingly or whether as trafficking victims, as well as when they are forcibly repatriated to North Korea in direct violation of the 1951 UN Refugee Convention. To better understand this, North Korea's Songbun social political caste system must be discussed. The Songbun system discriminates against all North Koreans within 51 subclassifications and three main classifications. There's a loyal or core class, 20 to 25% of the population, a wavering class, 40 to 60% of the population, the hostile class, 
20 to 25 percent of the population. Uh, this is a socio-economic caste system that impacts all walks of life, all people, a system that affects everything and anything to do with access to education, jobs, and services. This Songbun system is the root cause of many subsequent human rights abuses. The hostile class lives the most difficult lives in North Korea. Many of those imprisoned in the system of penal labor camps are classified as hostile. They're also concentrated in the northeastern provinces where few to no basic services are provided to them. Uh, the negative impacts of the Songbun system especially affect the most vulnerable, including women, children, the elderly, the disabled, prisoners, including pregnant women. Without adequate food and necessities based on their Songbun, North Korean women and children may be forced to flee the country to survive. This is a consequence of the discrimination they face on a daily basis. With the rise in the proportion of North Korean women, so to say, married to Chinese men, has come a corresponding rise in the number of children born to North Korean women and Chinese men. North Korean women and children are highly vulnerable to forcible repatriation by Chinese authorities. When women are forcibly re repatriated to the DPRK, they're often separated from their children, violating their fundamental right to family. North Korean officials treat women who are forcibly repatriated especially harshly. Women who are pregnant with Chinese men are seen as impure. Many women do not disclose that they uh, became pregnant with Chinese men in China. Uh, for fear that they will be subjected to more beatings and interrogation, North Korean officials commonly use racial slurs while forcibly aborting these women's babies or committing infanticide. These North Korean officials also put the women back in their prison cells with no adequate medical treatment. North Korea's Ministry of State Security, also the Ministry of Social Security, torture and commit forced abortions against pregnant women forcibly repatriated from China because they're viewed as enemies of the regime. Because they're pregnant with Chinese men, these women are labeled by the regime as disloyal and traitors to the nation. We have documented evidence of persecution based on gender, race, religion. While some of the acts of persecution against North Koreans may amount to crimes against humanity, for the purposes of this event today, I would like to mention persecution based on national, ethnic, or racial grounds as possible evidence of genocide. Uh, in the, of course, the spirit of Article 2 of the Genocide Convention and the definition of genocide within that article. North Korea acceded to the Genocide Convention in 1989. In order to argue that genocide is occurring, one must have documentation of criminal acts against a protected group. Pregnant North Korean women who have been forcibly repatriated from China may be such a protected group, arguably based on their ethnicity, as having a shared culture, a shared language, or perhaps the race of their um, children conceived uh, with uh, Chinese men and their unborn babies. Based on interviews, we know that repatriated North Korean women are screened for pregnancy. At times, they're treated harshly if they have forgotten words in their native tongue. Uh, they're forced to undergo abortions. Uh, they endure infanticide uh, simply because they have been in China, where they were often human trafficking victims, simply because they're pregnant with Chinese partners or abusers. There could be an argument that unborn children of North Korean mothers and Chinese fathers or abusers are a protected group based on their race. North Korea does not want impure Korean blood inside the country. Remember that blood is a central fundamental building block of the cult of the Kim regime. Escapees have repeated this time and time again. The criminal acts of North Korean officials against women and unborn babies are numerous. Uh, they include killing and various types of bodily and mental harm. The women and girls forcibly repatriated from China have no other option other than going to the prison system and facing these crimes. 
the focus is always on the women and girls and not on the men who are responsible for the raping or the abuse. This also needs to change. Forcibly repatriated women are mentally harassed. They're treated harshly, assaulted. They're victimized for having been in China, for having become pregnant. Uh, even the women who are not pregnant are not safe. They often have to deny that they have children in China or they have to face more severe punishment. When pregnant women and girls are denied by North Korean officials, the God-given right of giving birth to their children, this is an intentional act to prevent the birth and creation of a North Korean Chinese group within North Korean society. Continued work needs to be done to document and understand these acts and legally argue whether the protected group is pregnant, repatriated North Korean women from China, or their babies conceived with Chinese men or both. Regardless of the legal definitions and characterizations, we do know that this is an ongoing atrocity that urgently requires the international community's attention. The second point that I would like to make pertains to the COVID-19 pandemic, which has surely worsened the humanitarian situation for North Koreans and trafficked North Korean women and children. Uh, Kim Jong-un's border restrictions, COVID-19 border restrictions have caused alarming reports on the worsening humanitarian situation in North Korea. The good health and well-being of North Korean women and children are critical under the COVID-19 pandemic and after. Uh, and in particular, one should keep in mind women and children in detention who have been victims of human trafficking. Prior and during their detention, they often lack access to medical care and proper nutrition. Women lack adequate reproductive care. They face sexual, gender-based violence as human trafficking victims and as prisoners. Under today's COVID-19 pandemic, under stricture measures in China and on the Sino-DPRK border, it is more difficult for others to assist North Korean women and children who have fled North Korea into China. North Korean women who are trafficked in China also have fewer options to escape. They have likely been pushed into deeper isolation, hiding, confinement, due in part to the COVID-19 pandemic. This makes them even more vulnerable to sexual and gender-based violence where the power dynamics are vastly unequal. With my colleague's permission, please allow me to put forth a, a set of uh, recommendations as well. I would like to highlight opportunities for sustainable and resilient recovery in North Korea after the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly relevant to the good health and well-being of North Korean women and children. Why not in line with the sustainable development goal number three? And in light of our discussion today, uh, North Korea and the international community should prioritize North Korean women and children in their efforts to conduct sustainable development. In particular, as North Korean women and children in detention are often victims of trafficking, the provision of medicine, healthcare services, food and micronutrients should focus on such vulnerable groups. Uh, I would respectfully urge both the DPRK and the PRC authorities to accept visits by the UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the DPRK, Mr. Tomas Ojea Quintana, and also representatives of the Office of the UN High Commission for Human Rights. Such visits would be opportunities to assess the impact of COVID-19 on aspects focused on human security in general, including the nutritional and health insecurity of vulnerable groups in the DPRK. Such visits could certainly serve as a precursor to conceptualizing and designing a comprehensive, sustainable, and inclusive approach to implementing the sustainable development goals in North Korea. My organization wishes to express our concern regarding the potential worsening humanitarian situation primarily due to North Korea's self-imposed isolation, assessments are urgently needed to determine the situation inside the country. Our recommendation is for a post-COVID reset that factors in both human rights and humanitarian concerns 
into delivery of aid and assistance should that happen. I would also urge North Korea to include human rights, non-governmental organizations and humanitarian aid organizations in these visits, perhaps why not beginning with civil society organizations in UN consultative status such as our own. This would facilitate a more comprehensive dialogue cognizant of both human security needs and a human rights upfront approach. It is imperative to protect North Korean refugees. Those refugees forcibly repatriated to the DPRK face a credible fear of persecution, harsh interrogation, torture, internment in prison camps, and death. These North Korean refugees deserve the protection of the people and government of China and others. We plead for their protection. We also urge the PRC China to stop the refoulement of North Koreans to their country and instead allow them legal protections or safe passage to a third country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Greg. And now I'd like to give the floor to Jihan Park. Jihan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me today. So human trafficking has been one of Asia's biggest challenges, especially North Korean women and girls. Human trafficking is far more prevalent, complex, and close than more of us realize. Many NGOs and human rights activists who all agree that North Korea is the number one abuse of human rights Raleigh addressed the abuse and the human rights of North Korean women and girls. The abuse of human rights in North Korea, caused by the world famous three, three dictators, have been known for a long time. However, in North Korea, women experience far more discrimination in society and family life than men, which is not spoken about. The strong patriarchal uh, aspects of North Korean society continue to affect women, despite a socialist, socialist regime that claims to pursue gender equality. My experience bear witness to the fearless of states, non-governmental organizations, and the human rights activities. Sadly, I am not alone. The sex, human tra sex trafficking of North Korean women and girls in China is more prevalent, more complex, and far closer at many listeners. I am North Korean survivor of human trafficking of this event, may appreciate. As a victim of human trafficking, I felt disgraced and humiliated and had many painful memories that I wanted to hide and bury in my heart. But today, I am anti-human trafficking activities and a messenger for North Korean women and the girls who you never met. Today, my points are first, sex trafficking North Korean women, second, stateless children, uh, repatriation, and what happened inside North Korea, including my story. Three male generations of Kim Drastic have ruled my homeland for 75 years. Like all North Korean women, I had no rights under the rule, no right of freedom, revolt, or the pursuit of happiness. My family was left apart and our relationship subverted. I was forced to endure the starvation and was driven from my homeland by desperation and fear, trafficked into China. I was deceived by a broker and sold into marriage for 5,000 Chinese yuan. It is 720 US dollars. It's as tragic as it is common, 80% North Korean women and girls who escape become victims of human trafficking and sold to Chinese men who exploited to them labor and sex. In 2019, Korea Future Initiative published a report and said that cyber sex trafficking also happened in China 
and the annual profit is $105 million. I spent six years as a slave. I gave birth to a son, but he was statelessness. The reason is that I am North Korean. As a North Korean woman, I never had a passport or birth certificate or ID card. It's just one of many ways the state controls me. Without the documents, you can't live, you can't travel, you can't get a job, you can't open a bank account. And the China still won't acknowledge the 30,000 children born in China to a North Korean parents. I was stateless, so was my son too. This world mentioned about North Korean refugees, but no one mentions about the stateless. North Korean people, they never get their own passport, so they can't travel freely, can't leave. Country always control people. So I say that all North Koreans are stateless and 21st century slavers. In 2014, United Nations Commission of Inquiry mentioned that 20,000 statelessness children in China who were born in North Korean mothers. But nobody care about these children nowadays. I was arrested by Chinese police and I was repatriated to North Korea and separated my five years old child. For the crime of being trafficked and sold, the government of North Korea incarcerated me in a camp where I was forced to endure acts that will haunt me for the rest of my life. This is all happened because I am a North Korean woman. North Korea also not accept foreigner child, but Chinese Communist Party repatriated all North Koreans, including pregnant women too. When they back to North Korea, they abortions this child, but they not bring it to the hospital. They hard work in field, making a building or God killed unborn babies in front of mothers. Unspeakable this evil dictatorship country and the world never see this real country. Women and the girls sex trafficking is not only in China. In 2019, Radio Free Asia published an article said that North Korea officials asked to Chinese businessmen, they need rich men who married North Korean females. North Korea government never accept foreign marriage, but they need money, so they need to sell North Korean females to Chinese rich men. And we also known as foreign workers. Many females work in restaurants and they earn the money to government. It is also traffic issues too. After I escaped from North Korea a second time, and thankfully found freedom in the United Kingdom. I have looked on as mayor statesmen, mayor experts, mayor dominated conference, mayor journalists have attempted to explain my homeland. Most have failed to understand that the story of North Korea is also the story of female subjugations or structural, sexual, and physical violence. North Korean women and girls are greased for the meal. We are expendable. We must experience horror until we are forced into subjugation, death, or escape. Our bodies are ported for the men and the ideology that rules our lives. In such an uncaring world, what can be done for my countrymen? Peace can never be brought to countries or people governed by men who despite women. That much is clear to all who open their eyes. Making a difference in the fight against human trafficking is therefore daunting.
but not impossible. It is obvious that we must target China's sex trade and trafficking links for removal and actively rescues and protect victims. And we must also confront of main problem the government of North Korea at its source. I will not give up and it's my hope that the voice of my countrywomen that this event will speak for all the voices, voiceless North Korean women and the girls. And the world will finally listen. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Jihan, for sharing your story and for speaking for the voiceless women of North Korea. Thank you very much for that. We have some some time for questions and answers. So now I'll, I will give the floor to Jess Templeman to, to proceed with the next um, part of this webinar. Thank you, Evelina, and thank you to all our panelists, and especially Jihan, thank you so much for sharing some of your story and your testimony. I know it will have touched everybody. Um, who heard it. And actually, my first question is to you. It's um, from Amanda and she says, thank you for speaking today. You are a very strong person and a source of inspiration for many, if I may say so. Could, you, could I please ask you where you draw your strength from? What motivates you to speak out on behalf of your, of your fellow North Koreans? So uh, Jihan, I just wonder if you could answer that. I came to the UK in 2008, but uh, I didn't know the what's meaning so human rights and the freedoms. So until the 2012, I never spoke about the, my experience to the world. But once in, uh, in 2012, once my old son asked me a question, mommy, why did you abandon me and leave me? because it was five years old child memories, because I sent back to North Korea in front of my child, but this child didn't understand why Chinese police came to uh, my house and they arrested my mother. But many Chinese people told to him, not only him, all Chinese uh, people told to many, same as the children, your mom is never come back, your mom is abandoned you. So that is all children's memories. So when I heard these questions, then I look back around the, my, uh, is next to another person's. Many painful stories and many voiceless people next to me and they need someone's voice. So then I started speak about the, my experience to our world because we wanted to save these people and how the world know about the North Korean women and the girls' situations. So that's why I start to speak about my experience. Thank you um, for sharing. I, um, I have a question here from David, which actually I think if I count it from David Maxwell, I think is five separate questions. So I'm going to split it up. Um, and. Firstly, I think to all the panelists, but I know um, Lord Alton and Greg, you will definitely have opinions about this. Um, is the current UN Security Council framework, the resolutions, um, are they sufficient for dealing with, I would, I would say human trafficking within this context? Um, I know there are many debates about the wider human trafficking uh, context, but with specifically within this context, do you feel the UN systems are acceptable and if not what would you like to see changed um so i don't know lord alton whether you want to remark first um yes i'll kick off and i'm sure as you say greg will want to discuss this as well uh, the lack of capacity within international organizations the which have become derelict i think is one of the big issues that the incoming u.s administration is going to have to put its mind to the US, for quite understandable reasons in some ways, which saw the subversion of a whole raft of UN institutions, including the Human Rights Council, the Security Council itself, even the General Assembly, uh, and organizations like the World Health Organization, the International Labor Organization, uh, UNESCO, a whole range of US, uh, UN uh, institutions. The US saw these being 
subverted and not serving its interests. And you can understand why the White House decided in, under the Trump administration to just uh, walk out and hook, line and sinker, uh, uh, abandon those institutions. Um, at heart, I'm someone who believes in reform if reform is still possible. And given that uh, it was Eleanor Roosevelt and uh, some of the leading figures in post-war Europe uh, who together across the Atlantic created those institutions in 1948 in the first place, I think it falls on our generation to renew them and to make them work. You look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that came out of that experience in 1948. Virtually every one of the 30 articles in the UN Declaration are broken in North Korea. North Korea is in breach of almost every one of those uh, articles in the UN Declaration. And yet we seem incapable of standing up and doing anything about it. The Rome Statute, uh, which came out of the failure to deal with things like genocides in, in Rwanda, later in Darfur, and we can go all the way back to, uh, to, to the Armenian genocide, which has finally been recognized by the Biden administration, by the president, as having been a genocide. It happened in 1915. 1 1.3 million people were killed. Organizations like the United Nations, uh, like the International Criminal Court, they were set up to prevent these things from happening again. And the International Labour Organization is supposed to be there to stop people from being trafficked and exploited. And yet we know it's one of the biggest money garnering uh, activities, criminal activities in the world today. So what we see again and again are the failure of these institutions. And we've seen that, that they have been suborned, they've been subverted principally in recent years by the Chinese Communist Party um, that have bought the support of countries, particularly in, in, in parts of Asia and Africa, where they provide development projects, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, funding, indebtedness, uh, and then hold those countries to ransom and expect their votes to be delivered uh, to prevent any action from being taken. Um, to, to prevent any action from being taken in the, those relevant organizations. And so you take North Korea as an example. The United Nations set up a commission of inquiry. Excellent. They chose a brilliant jurist, a judge from Australia, Michael Kirby. He carried out diligently his inquiry into what was happening in North Korea. He found at the end of it that there was enough evidence at a technical legal level to say that crimes against humanity were being committed in North Korea. He recommended in that report that the Security Council should consider this and refer it to the International Criminal Court. It has never happened because China has said it would veto, veto such a recommendation. Similarly, what is happening in Tigray, which was a subject of a, one of these webinars in, in recent days, that has not been referred through the Security Council, again, because China and Russia have said that they will use their vetoes to prevent action from being taken. So you see the subversion and the incapacitation of these international institutions. So you either walk away from them all and say, well, they've all lost the plot, there's nothing we can do, or you try to renew them. And I think that that is what we in the Western liberal democracies have got to do. We've got to uphold the rule of law, we've got to uphold human rights, and we've got to uphold democratic values. And you see those being challenged everywhere from the killing fields of Xinjiang, to the exploitation of Uyghur labor, the incarceration in forced labor camps, to the concentration camps of North Korea, to the atrocities in Tigray. You can see, I could go on, the, the, the list goes on and on and on, which demonstrates why we, in, in this post-COVID world, and I was struck by what Greg was saying about how we have to have a plan for what we do subsequently, um, the subversion of the World Health Organization and what happened in Wuhan, the suppression of information, all those things should put us now on the attack and say, we are gonna make a reality of what we believe in, which are the liberal values of the, of, of the rule of law, human rights and democracy. And we should be fighting for those everywhere from Xinjiang to Hong Kong to all the places that many of us on this call care about. 
Jess, I guess there's very little to add to uh, Lord Alton's uh, excellent statement. Uh, let me say this in response to Professor Maxwell's question, and I'm preaching to the choir here, of course. Um, uh, UN Security um, Council sanctions do not factor in a human rights rationale. They have two goals in mind. One is to prevent the development and proliferation of North Korean nuclear weapons and ballistic missiles. The second one is to punish the elites in charge of their development and proliferation by severing their access to luxury goods imported from the outside world. Now, arguably, the, the latest round of, uh, of sanctions also banned the, the deployment of uh, North Korean workers officially dispatched overseas a uh, rather important source of revenue for the regime, but the rationale behind that was not a human rights rationale. Again, the rationale was to sever a critical line of funding that fuels the regime's nuclear and missile program. Following the February 2014 report of the UN Commission of Inquiry that Lord Alton mentioned uh, in 2014, 15, 16, and 17 in December, the, the UN Security Council made uh, North Korean human rights an agenda item. That was a very important step. Um, regrettably, for three years in a row, 2018, 2019, 2020, that did not happen, and perhaps we, the United States, uh, should have assumed a more assertive role as part of a what we used to know as a very proactive coalition of like-minded states the United Kingdom, the United States, the European Union, Japan, the Republic of Korea, pushing for relevant action on North Korean human rights at the UN. I'm very hopeful that the current Biden administration has clearly signaled that shared values, including human rights, values we share with like-minded uh, governments and UN member states, as well as multilateralism, will be two of the pillars of this administration's foreign policy. I would uh, take the liberty of arguing that this year it will be very important to bring human rights back onto the agenda of the Security Council. Of course, just a few months ago, we saw a, a very good effort led by the government of Germany to make sure, together with like-minded states, that uh, the item remains on the agenda because if you don't take it up for three years and this is a UN technicality, it drops off the agenda. It will stay on the agenda and my hope is that we will see a revival of this coalition involving not only the US, the UK, the European Union and the government of Japan, but hopefully also the Republic of Korea. This is an entirely different discussion. Uh, under the current government, the Republic of Korea has slipped up has cracked down on North Korean human rights organizations and activists. That's another development that we're deeply concerned about. We're eagerly waiting for the Republic of Korea to return to the coalition to continue to actively support these efforts at the UN. Thank you, Greg. Um, Jihan, I want to give you an option, uh, well, an opportunity to answer if you, if you wish to contribute anything about your feeling around how the UN um, and other international institutions might better effectively advocate for your people in your homeland in terms of human trafficking? I have lots of questions about the, this the United Nations and also many uh, human rights activists groups, but uh, they only speak about that is uh, stop repatriation, repatriation issues, and uh, we're not talked about the China something that, and they not kind of make some actions. Yes, yeah, so that's why. And I, I've not known more about the law or the world law and the, something that. So last the few years, I have researched many many reports. You know, and. Uh, uh, and someone uh, is uh, already reports, everything is I read. And then I found the one thing is statelessness issues. Because when we usually said that is we rescue North Korean refugees, but how? Because China never accept uh, to us refugees. So I, my point is that is we need temporary passport to give to them. 
Then they left China and they wanted to go third countries, pre third countries. That is nowadays options. And then this is, we saved many North Korean refugees nowadays. So we, this world, we have to think about these issues carefully. And then we want to work together. This Thank you, um, Jihan. And actually, you've just you've just co-opted my next question, um, which was which actually I will still ask for the other panelists, which is from So Young Kim, who said, um, "We know that North Korea itself is not likely to take action to protect North Korean refugees, not only in China but elsewhere, and it's also hard to expect China to stop repatriating North Korean escapees." But China's authority is key to making actual improvements on this issue. And are there any practical recommendations, solutions that the panelists wish to suggest um, in terms of tackling this issue? So, um, Jian, I think you've already mentioned about passports, but I, I wonder if Lord Orton or Greg, you wish to come in on any other issues. I think Jillian's point about passports is a, is a very good one. Um, how you would make that happen in practical terms is, is perhaps another question, but I, I think that we should be standing up a lot more strongly than we have done on the principle of reform of refugees and China's breach of the convention on, on, on re repatriation of refugees. We, China has taken a place on the Human Rights Council of the United Nations, so one practical thing that we could do uh, in addition to uh, the keeping the issue on the agenda of, of, of the Security Council, even though we know that China will go on with Russia uh, vetoing any, any real action being taken, it is possible to get things done further down the tree. And I think that by making sure that resolutions go before the General Assembly and that we call out China in the Human Rights Council, especially on its own treatment of refugees and its failure to one of the obligations it's supposed to now be upholding within that council. Uh, I think that that would be a, a practical and useful thing that we could do. Um, I also know, though, from discussions I've had in the past with Chinese officials, that they themselves are deeply uneasy at the idea of racism being used uh, in North Korea. After all, North Korea is the only country which China has an official uh, alliance with. It's signed a a treaty with to, to so it's regarded as a as its its own only real ally uh, and yet here is a country that says that if you come back impregnated into north korea uh, by a chinese man we will regard this as a dilution of our bloodline in the way that greg was describing earlier on and from those reports that i i cited um, and that baby has will not be allowed to be born uh, such is our objection to the dilution of the bloodline so I think that is something that we should be protesting about because it's hard to imagine how China could defend those things from happening if it was forced out into the open and into open discussion. And then there's the issue of genocide that Greg said he might come back to and perhaps we can tempt him to say more as well as the groups that he identified, but something about the religious groups inside North Korea. Um, Mr. Justice Kirby left it as an open question uh, in his report about whether you could argue that a genocide uh, has been committed against Christians in North Korea. But it's worth remembering that Pyongyang was called the Jerusalem of the East in the period before the Korean War. Such was the scale of uh, Christian faith and belief in the North, uh, and as is the case uh, in the non-communist South to, to this very day. But we know that people were, were brutally dealt with. I mean, the people were were murdered, they were executed, uh, they were frog marched into uh, concentration camps, uh, imprisoned, families broken up because of anyone uh, being identified as having a, a religious belief. So I think there is scope here on, on that question as well for us to look and see whether this is a technical uh, violation of the, of the crime of genocide. The countries who have signed that convention, the 1948 Convention on the Crime of Genocide, are duty bound to predict when they see a genocide underway to then try and prevent it from happening, to protect, and then finally to punish. So, you know, we are 
duty we are signatory to, the United Kingdom is a signatory, uh, the United States is a signatory to the genocide convention. It is our duty to bring to account those who've been responsible for these crimes. And because there are still people who are alive to this day who escaped from the country, one woman, Hei Wu, for instance, who appeared before us here in the Westminster Parliament at a session I chaired, described the things that had been done to her as a Christian woman in one of those camps. Another Christian woman who spoke at one of our hearings here described how, and these were her words, they tortured the Christians the most. She said that uh, hot metal was pushed into their, into their bodies uh, and, and gave us a, a graphic description of some of the terrible, wicked things that had been done. So there is evidence. I think it's worth revisiting and seeing whether that's an initiative which we could get lawyers to, uh, to test and to see whether that's a case that could be brought. Thank you, Lord Orton. Um, Greg, I'm aware we've, we're running very close on time, but I want to give you an opportunity to bring in your thoughts on this question too. Much appreciated, Jess. Uh, certainly, I, I fully agree with Lord Alton. This was once the Jerusalem of the East. The intensity of the repression of Christians uh, was on par with Nero's Rome, and I don't think that's an exaggeration. Uh, this oppression, repression, crimes against humanity, perhaps genocide based on racial, uh, ethnic, gender, religious reasons has continued to this day. Um, the UN Commission of Inquiry appended a letter to the 2014 UNCOI report, a letter addressed by the Chief Commissioner Justice Kirby to the Chinese authorities warning them that by continuing their policy of forcibly repatriating North Korean refugees in direct violation of the 1951 convention and its 1967 additional protocol, China was aiding and abetting a regime committing crimes against humanity. China, as Lord Alton pointed out, is on the Human Rights Council. We must continue to remind China that there is a steep political price associated with aiding and abetting the DPRK regime. The second and final point that I would like to make is that pursuant to the constitution of South Korea, the Republic of Korea, all Koreans are citizens of the Republic of Korea. Thus, uh, what efforts are our friends, allies, and partners in South Korea making to protect those North Korean refugees in China? Are they reaching out to the Chinese authorities, especially under the current COVID-19 circumstances to protect and perhaps to bring those refugees to South Korea because that's where they belong and they don't have to, to worry about all of the issues they're experiencing in the North. So I would strongly urge our South Korean friends, the current government of President Moon Jae-in to reach out to China and to seek ways to protect these refugees and to bring these refugees to South Korea. Some of them, of course, have made their way to South Korea. The numbers have been really small. We're at 34,000 right now, especially under COVID with travel restrictions in place, the numbers have declined dramatically. So South Korea, please come back to the coalition of like-minded states. Thank you very much, Greg. And um, as we conclude the event, I would like to say a big kudos to, to you, Lord Alton, to Greg uh, Scarlatoyu and uh, Jihan Park for important contributions and to Jess for her wonderful work on the Q&A section. And also a big kudos to the Office of Lorton of Liverpool, Amanda mortwet Oh, and the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea for co-organizing this event. And to all our attendees for joining us today, but also if there is anything um, in relation to human rights violations in North Korea since 2014 that you would like to raise with us, please uh, get in touch um, over the next week or so. So we'll make sure that it is included in the upcoming report. So please stay in touch. Thank you very much.